Hello and welcome to this month's edition of Slugger TV. This month we're going to be looking at the Tory leadership contest, the implications of Brexit and where we are in terms of Northern Ireland politics. And to go through these interesting topics, we have Aidan Conley from the Northern Ireland Retail Consortium. We have Andre Murphy, commentator, and we have the Irish News' Brendan Hughes. So if I just start off with you, Aidan, um, what do you make of, obviously, Theresa May is about to go. Uh, we have whittled our way down to now the final two candidates, Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson. What have you made of the Conservative leadership contest so far? Uh, well, we uh, managed to get talking to, to some of the contenders. Uh, Sajid Javid uh, was over in, in, in Belfast. Uh, so was Rory Stewart. Uh, and so was Kit Malthouse. And uh, two days after he met with us, Kit Malthouse uh, decided he wasn't going to go any further in the race. So I don't know whether I can take credit for that, but uh, uh, maybe I can. As far as who we're left with, um, it's actually quite disappointing. Uh, if you look at what Boris Johnson is saying, especially as far as Brexit is concerned, he refuses to see that there is a problem. He thinks that kind words and, and unicorns will, will solve this. He believes that the technology already exists. And, and as soon as you push him on any sort of detail, he sidesteps that. Now, that's not what business needs. On the other side, you've got Jeremy Hunt. And it's just as disappointing. Um, last week, he was in Kidderminster. He was talking about how he went to a factory where they make uh, wheels um, and that their profit margin was 4%. And he actually said that um, they would go under uh, if there was a hard Brexit. Um, but that's OK, because you still have to deliver Brexit because it's a democracy. Now, if they're willing to do that with places in the United Kingdom and in, in, in Great Britain specifically, um, they're not going to prioritise what we have here in, in, in Northern Ireland. So far, it, it's been very disappointing as far as the, the leadership contest is concerned. What we do need uh, to do, and, and I suppose the message from the business community remains the same, is we need a deal. Um, these things only happen if there's a no deal scenario on the 31st of October. And our message for this past two years has been that we need a deal. Mm -hmm. Okay, Andrew, what have you made so far of the Conservative leadership? Well, what I felt is that there's been this real disconnect between ourselves here and what's happening in London, probably in a really stark way than we've probably felt before. I felt that you can really tell that here doesn't matter at all. The only time it's mentioned is in the context of how you might in, engage with the withdrawal agreement and they really don't care about that either. They're just spinning us a line around about something that may happen once they go to Brussels um, at some point. But no matter what, they're not that worried about that because the 31st of October, Halloween, is what they are going to do. How English Tories react to the date of Halloween is the only thing they're interested in. Mm -hmm. So for us here, the disconnect to Westminster and London continues to grow and that has the that feeds into the broader conversation we're having about our constitutional settlement and about how Brexit is is in um, is, is, is having an impact on that. And Brendan what have you been making of the machinations of the Conservative Party so far? Well, I think the problem is, and I think this is a problem for any sort of, um, whether it's an election or any sort of leadership contest, is that the politics is really pie in the sky. You know, the, we have two contenders here um, who are promising the world to try and get over the line and to be mm -hmm. uh, the British Prime Minister and to be leader of the Tory party. But really, it, for us in Northern Ireland, it really comes down to the reality of things. And we want to see, I suppose, whenever that leader is elected, um, whether they will then be able to face up to the realities of the situation they will face with Brexit um, over the next couple of months, over the summer recess, and whether they can then um, come to the realisation of what, what needs to be done and the uh, practicalities of um, what would happen if there is a no-deal Brexit. Um, but unfortunately, we have um, Boris Johnson at the moment is saying that there needs to be um, Brexit happening by October the 31st. And we have Jeremy Hunt, who's wavering around something similar um, um, he wants to have Brexit delivered as well and would, would think that it would be uh, catastrophic for the party mm -hmm. if they don't deliver Brexit and then go into a general election. So, you know, you have these, these parties that are talking to their bases, but they're not thinking of the country, uh, the UK as a whole, as to um, how that would uh, play out across, um, across both Britain and Northern Ireland. And that's the problem, I suppose, we face across the water here. Mm -hmm. OK, and obviously, when you dissect the two of them, obviously, Boris Johnson has October 31st, come what may. Jeremy Hunt's a little bit more. If we need to take a little bit more time to get a deal over the line, then we'll do it. 
do any of those, I mean, from your experience in the business community, do either of the, does, does Jeremy Hunt's position reassure you even a, a little bit? Well, I, I think the, the fact that he is trying to play both camps, he is saying that we're going out whether we have a deal or not, and then he's saying that there might be this chance of, of an extension. It doesn't provide the certainty that, 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 that business needs. Um, I think, you know, where we are as far as the Tory leadership is con concerned is, right, we're going to park Northern Ireland on the border and, and, and we'll, we'll talk about how, you know, it, it's when people are sort of talking about emotion rather than economics and people are talking about politics rather than, than, than the people of it and, and jingoism rather than jobs. Sure. You know, th this, is, this is, is where we are at the minute, the state of, of politics in the United Kingdom. Um, it's almost as if we've sort of transposed it from here over to there. Going forward, as far as what the business community needs, um, when we're looking at um, the 31st of October, an extension would, would, would be good and definitely preferable to no deal. But you have to ask why we're getting that extension. Um, we need to be looking at taking this as, as uh, uh, the final end game in all of this is that there is going to be a new normal. Now, is that new normal where we're going to have a lot of job losses, uh, a lot of households here won't be able to afford the, the groceries in the same way that they will today? Or is it going to be that we have a deal which allows that all to continue? And that's where the black and white in this is. It's not in the politics, but it's in the actual economics of it. Obviously, in the Conservative leadership, Jeremy Hunt is trying to play catch up with Boris Johnson because in terms of the MPs and the members, he has a solid lead. Um, do you think that the Jeremy Hunt's task in this thing is insurmountable? Do you think it's now pretty much a fait accompli now that Boris will become the next Prime Minister and Tory leader? It's certainly looking like that, where even the weekend where you had the personal scandal and you had you know, very, a very worrying episode at his flat in his apartment happening, having had no impact from what we can see mm -hmm. in terms of his chances of becoming the Conservative Party leader, it does seem that it's a fait accompli. I think it's really interesting that you're starting to see a commentary that's going, well, you are either pro-Brexit or you're pro-Union. And that is such an interesting conversation yeah. that started to happen as well and if that is to grow in the next couple of weeks in the run into the um, into the election that might be the only thing that changes the dynamic and that'll be very interesting to watch. I want to just Andrew's alluded to that there obviously we've seen this commentary creep up you had Ruth Davison the other day tweeting out Jeremy Hunt won't sacrifice the union and that's why she was backing him but then Julie Hartley Brewer who is a um, Brexit here a radio uh, show host tweeted out, anyone who's committed to, to maintaining the union will never deliver Brexit. How do you think they maintain those two strands? Well, I, I suppose whenever you look at polling of Tory members, the thing is that they seem to um, care more about delivering Brexit than actually maintaining the union. We have a situation where they, the majority are content to see Northern Ireland and um, become a United Ireland um, with the South. Um, they have, they're happy for Scotland to leave the, the United Kingdom as well. So really we're in a situation now where um, different views on this are entrenched and so therefore you know, Brexit at all costs seems to be the view that is, um, seems to be gaining momentum really within the, the party. Whether that will see out in the end, I suppose we have to wait and see. But I think um, the problem for um, Jeremy Hunt is that he is, seems to be so, um, he's sort of like a, a career politician, he's measured, he's pragmatic and so therefore that has a lot of connotations to what went before which was Theresa May. He was in um, her cabinet as well so he would be seen as being aligned to Theresa May and for um, I suppose Conservative members Boris Johnston represents a break from that so therefore he is the front runner and really it's, it's his race to lose at this yeah. stage. Obviously the Conservatives aren't really the only party involved here obviously the DUP are propping up the yeah. Conservative government so whoever the new prime ministers will have to be uh, aware of those 10 DUP votes. Arlene Foster has made similar comments to Ruth Davison this week uh, when she was speaking in Finchley of all places um, to Tories there that the union is the most important thing. Either nothing comes ahead of that. What, what, where does this place the DUP? Well, where does it place them, you know, because they had their fundraiser and they brought down Boris Johnson. Boris gave the, the speech to the masses and everyone was all delighted with him when he goes away because it was going to be absolutely, we're going, we're going to say not to accept this withdrawal agreement. A few days later, what does he do? He goes and votes for the withdrawal agreement. So they don't trust Boris at all. Mm -hmm. They don't trust a word he says. Whereas Jeremy Hunt is, is there 
apparently more pro-union at the minute, but I mean, it, there's not a lot between them. And for them, they're clearly, they don't want to say anything because they definitely don't want to rock a boat with whoever is going to be coming in. They want to foster a relationship with whoever is there. But at the same time, they're trying to put out hints. You can clearly see they're trying to put hints to the Conservative Party membership and going, this is our guy. This is the guy that we hope will maintain the union. So it's a, it's a tough gig for them at the minute. But they're also doing that while they're talking about putting up a say, trying to re-establish the executive here. Mm -hmm. And they nearly have a different message while they're talking in Belfast as well. So they've message in London, message in Belfast, and no one really knows where they stand. Yeah, okay. Um, now, obviously, another part of the Conservative um, Theresa May going is that one of her allies, um, few allies in the cabinet, is our own Secretary of State, Karen Bradley. And of course, there's speculation that Karen Bradley could be moved out of her post in the next month with a new prime minister coming in. Brendan, just on this, how likely do you think Karen Bradley is to remain in post? Uh, do you think uh, Boris or Jeremy Hunt could surprise us and keep her in? Um, I think, well, I think in short, her days are numbered. That's, I suppose, my um, prediction on how things are going to go. Um, you know, I think a lot of people would have seen the reason that Karen Bradley has remained in her post and has that um, posted within the cabinet is because of her um, relationship and loyalty to Theresa May and so therefore she is uh, very much associated with the previous government. So I don't see that if we are going to get, as people seem to be believing, a Boris Johnson government, um, I don't see how she fits into um, that cabinet in any position, let alone um, being within uh, being the Northern Ireland Secretary. And also, I suppose a, a big point in this is that um, it was reported that she would have backed Michael Gove for the Tory leadership. And if that was the case, I don't see the people around Boris Johnson taking too kindly to that and letting her remain in the position. Um, if it's a Jeremy Hunt government, it might be there might be a little more thought goes into this. I, I sort of see um, you know, him and the people around him as being a bit more pragmatic in this situation. And so therefore, they will weigh up to themselves mm -hmm. whether they feel that that um, you know, changing the, the person who is Secretary of State could in any way um, derail um, what discussions are going on at Stormont to try and get the, the institutions in Northern Ireland back up and running. But um, I think that the, the message that's been sent out from the parties here is that they feel that a new Secretary of State is needed um, to try and um, reset relations and to um, you know, give it a, a bit more of a, a bounce to, to get things going um, here. Um, so I really don't see how she can remain in that position. Are you in you of the of the view that she could be in her last uh, three or four weeks in office? Boris Johnson came out and uh, he made a, a a huge thing of collective responsibility within that cabinet, and he is saying that his new cabinet, if he's prime minister, must all agree uh, that no deal is an option, and that they will carry out uh, a, a, a no deal Brexit if needs be. Now, I don't think Karen Bradley's conscience will allow her to sign up to that. Uh, quite simply because a she's backed uh, Theresa May deals from the very start. Uh, and B, you know, through talking to us, there is a genuine concern, as far as Karen Bradley is concerned, uh, about um, whether or not uh, that Northern Ireland will have that disaster um, if there is no deal. And I don't think her conscience will allow her to do it. On the other side of things, it's very much a case of be very careful of what you wish for. Um, there are a lot of people who, uh, and you know what, Karen has, has uh, the Secretary of State has made uh, ma mistakes. Um, I think there's been a lot of good intentions there, but we need to be very careful about who comes in next. There are a lot of hardline people, hardline Brexiteers, who will want to look at things in a process-led way, um, which will literally be how do we make the best out of a bad lot, which isn't going to fly here in Northern Ireland. You could get someone in who doesn't understand the social complexities, who doesn't understand the economic integration that we have across these islands of supply chain, and basically is, is a, a, a functionary who is delivering a hard Brexit. Mm -hmm. Now, if we get that, we're in trouble. Just to make a point on that, I think that you know there have been reports that people like Gavin Williamson could be considered for the role of Northern Ireland Secretary. And if that's the case, um, I think that during Karen Bradley's time and during the time that we've had this confidence and supply deal with the DUP, there have been concerns that basically the uh, British government has been too aligned to one party to allow for a storm of talks process to work, to allow for you know devolution to work in Northern Ireland. But if it is the case that someone um, as a who's a more of a hardline Brexiteer or his, who is someone more like uh, Gavin Williamson, who has you know made his views clear in terms of um, you know former British soldiers being prosecuted 
prosecuted for um, troubles um, incidents, then um, I think we could see a hardening of um, positions and um, it could really derail any sort of um, hope of getting the executive back up and running. Andre, just to, uh, Brendan uh, jumps onto the point I was about to make. Obviously, the speculation was that if, if Boris was elected prime minister, uh, Gavin Williamson would be his choice. Gavin Williamson, of course, was up until fairly recently the defence secretary and has made lots of comments about you know, prosecutions in the past. What do you think? Things could always get worse. Part of what Karen Bradley did was create an environment where she was trying to speak out of both sides of her mouth, particularly on the legacy issue, but also around um, creating the institutions. She create, And she did a lot of harm. So on the one hand, you had zealots within the Conservative Party who were backing this idea that they could form a statute of limitations for state actors involved in conflict actions. She was saying to them, you cannot do that without that extending to um, non-state actors and so therefore the wider position of the government would be that we wouldn't have an amnesty and so that seemed like a reasonable mm -hmm. thing except she also was involved along with Theresa May with this narrative saying that there is a disproportionate approach to investigations of state actors which created a hysteria around this which meant that the and a gap which meant that this sort of um another type of jingoistic type of approach was it was taken where sta the experience of state actors was was skewed in a way and they were separated from processes of law and order ha if someone like Gavin, Gavin Williamson or that approach is taken into into the processes of trying to re-establish the executive when dealing with the past is already toxic and already a huge barrier to the creation of the, these executive it will be over for a generation, without a doubt, strand one of the Good Friday Agreement, let alone the other parts of the mm -hmm. Good Friday Agreement already being in, pro in crisis, strand one will be over if someone like that is to come, out, to come in along with Brexit um, within the next year, we, we will see ourselves in a far worse position than where we yeah. already are. Yeah. So probably a, you'd imagine a conciliator would be, probably be someone who would be better placed in terms of being the Secretary of State. Okay, so um, on to the, the next issue. Obviously, um, Northern Ireland, it, seem, it seems like it's Groundhog Day. We're always sitting talking about the kind of the paralysis that we have within Northern Ireland. And I'll just start off with you, Aidan. In terms of where we are at the minute politically, as we come up to the summer break now, and it looks like we will have um, some sort of summer break now um, in terms of the talks, how likely are we? To, we did this at the, at, the seeming at the end of every political season. How likely are we to get a government back this at this point this year, do you think? Um, not not hugely. I don't think that any of the political parties uh, want to get back uh, until Brexit is, is settled. No one wants to take responsibility for it. Um, and and the, th the thing is, Brexit, you know, I, I was asked this morning, how big is Brexit? And big, Brexit is the biggest threat to our economy since the Troubles. And, and, and it is that simple. Um, but the stalemate uh, isn't, uh, it's not just about Brexit. If you look at things like business rates in Scotland, they've had the Barclay Review, the recommendations of which are being uh, put forward and, 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 and delivered upon. If you look uh, at, uh, you know, the, 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 the longer this goes on, the further we're falling behind Great Britain and the Republic of Ireland. But it's not just about the money for business. One of the things that really irks me about this is in Scotland, they have a private member's bill on shop workers' protection. That means that it'll be uh, more of an offence and higher penalties for people who are abusive and violent to, sta to staff. Westminster for England and Wales have actually put, starting to push that through as well, through the Offensive Weapons Bill. But we have no minister, we have no executive, we have no assembly to even get a private member's bill through. So it's not just about the money. It's going to uh, affect, as it already has done, people's lives. But the thing is, it's not just now. Big retailers, big companies, take uh, investment decisions 24 months, 36 months in advance. And what we're doing is the longer this goes on, the longer it will be until we see the, that investment happening. That's going to mean that there's a strangulation on jobs. It means that there's a lack of investment. And it means that this, even when we do get the assembly, we'll have to be going around with a begging bowl to get people to see Northern Ireland as a great place to invest, which is hugely disappointing. OK. Andrew, would you, are you any ho more hopeful that we could potentially get a government back at some point this year? 
I'm usually hopeful, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I am, <laughs> right? Because there's reasons, and you're right. There, there are reasons that you can see that are make it very unlikely. So you you have Brexit. No one wants to move before they see the implications of that. You have the RHI report having to, you know, having to come about. What's that going to mean for the partners in a potential government? Without a doubt, that's sitting there. Um, you you have dealing with the past. You have the legislation on dealing with the past sitting there as well, and its implications for policing and justice and all of those things. Those are the reasons that make it very difficult, along with, you know, another scandal around Ian Paisley and other mm -hmm. things like that. None of that, that helps. But there are also pressures to make it happen. And, you know, the, the talk, this round of talks came about because of the killing of Lyra McKee. And so the parties didn't look like they were going to go into a room until that point. It seemed like an almost like contrived element that the two governments were putting them in the room, but they have stayed in the room. And any of the things that are coming out of it, the vibes that are coming out is that people at least aren't arguing. They're, no one's walking out of anything. There isn't uh, that. Now that doesn't mean that there's concerted discussions happening, but it does mean that they're in the room, particularly around programmes for government, particularly around issues that are there. There are pressures on the parties to deliver on those issues. And you could see that with the local elections, not only in the north, but also in the south, that there is undoubtedly something about people wanting parties to take the power that is available to them and to deliver. So that is undoubtedly there. And I do think that creates a pressure. And I'm not sure that um, people want the, the politicians to remain as observers rather than participants during a Brexit negotiation. So I think all of those things are in the mix. Does that add up to a final result? Well, we really have to see how um, the parties decide to start talking to each other and about each other. And if they start to shift a bit, I, then I think that things are a little bit more positive than we probably would have thought they would be. Okay, Ben. Perhaps a Christmas deal would be more likely, but there is not going to be anything this side of Brexit. And um, I think that, you know, we've all made the point really that no one wants to be um, carrying the Brexit baby um, until it's until it's, uh, until it's delivered or whatever they, they don't want to they don't want to be involved they don't want to be involved in making that decision they um, will potentially deal with the after effects of it but the, you know they don't want to be the parties around the table and um, saying that they they were the ones that made the difficult decision on that uh, so that's the first thing I think that following the death of Lear McKee there was obviously an impetus um, from the parties to um, get around the table and to discuss this and see whether there could be common ground that would lead to uh, a new executive executive being formed, but I think that really the moment now has passed. Um, it, it seems from the you know sort of the reporting that's coming out of the talks that the sticking points are still the same and there doesn't seem to have been enough movement on them in order to allow for a new executive to be formed. And even if you just look around the peripheries of that, the reporting that's going on that, you know, for example, that we're doing in the paper, um, it's once again the parties are criticising each other over flags and potentially what's going to come up are bonfires and parades. We're into that season already now, and so therefore there's going to be, there's going to be no agreement anytime soon um, until that is over, until Brexit is over. And then I suppose we need to see whether there's going to be a, a more conciliatory tone coming from the main parties um, to see whether they could then get around the table. But at the moment, um, there is no conciliatory tone um, publicly. Um, they are entrenched in their, their various views, and so there's not going to be any change anytime soon. Okay, so another thing, just as Brendan has slightly alluded to with coverage, um, there was an interesting article uh, published earlier this week in the Irish Times by Stephen McCaffrey, uh, talking about the media and just, just the media in general, kind of it, it, its approach, how it covers different issues. And I'm just wondering in the context of Northern Ireland and how it's covered Brexit, how it's covered you know, issues around flags, identity, and so on and so forth. Aidan, well, what do you, what, what's your take on the media's role in terms of framing the debate in Northern Ireland? I think Ireland? there's a lot of issues in, in, uh, in, in Northern Ireland that are hand grenades, and some within the media are pulling the pin and run the way. And then we leave it to the social media crowd really to come in like, like vultures. And, and believe me, even on the, the, uh, on, on the Brexit stuff, there's been things that have been in the paper. The next thing you know, I'm getting uh, trades of abuse. Uh, and look, I'm very, very thick skin. Um, but it, you're getting trades of abuse because uh, it's seen as OK. I think the sensationalism of, of some of the things, the lowest common denominator uh, appeal um, is, is really quite, quite worrying. Now, in saying that, it's not all of the media that are, are doing that. And I think 
um, between investigative journalism that we've seen over this past two years and the coverage that we've had of the factual uh, side of Brexit, there's a lot to be positive and there's a lot to be happy with as far as the media in Northern Ireland is, is concerned. The only thing I will say is that people need to look for a bit more balance. Stephen McCaffrey's article was really interesting in how he pointed out that Larry McKee was looking for the voices we don't hear and what we don't talk about. And I thought that was really important. So my criticism of the media overall is that we don't hunt enough for those people who are left behind and who are missing. So for instance, yesterday there's a conference in West Belfast from the former prisoners community, a community that is spoken about in, in very derogatory terms, the former political prisoners and their families and their children who are now into their second generation and the needs that they have. They, they are either seen as a problem often in the media, when they could be portrayed as the contributors that they are to building peace, building communities and whatever. And that's just one example of that, you know, um, whether it's international reports on um, the legacy of, of torture and how what is happening in our prisons right now is a form of torture against women and children who are being held in custody. Those things we, we ignore and we don't hear those voices. If we started to hear more voices, would that open up the space so that that we realise that we have so much more possibility rather than the entrenched positions that the and traditional arguments that we are consistently hammering at. If we were to talk to more people and see the potential for con contribution rather than negativity, I think it could help. Okay, Bren. Um, I think that, well, Aidan mentioned about the need for balance. Um, I would not necessarily agree with that view because I think that the problem at the moment with balance is that um, the the way that balance is bestowed upon the media is that um, two arguments are given an equivalence mm -hmm. and so therefore you end up with more heat than light. So I think that what we need in the media more is, are um, fact checking basically and that you know the great things that are going on for example whenever uh, Boris Johnson was involved in his um, TV debate whenever there was the Tory leadership there were, there were more candidates at that stage and um, the BBC separately had their fact checking team looking at things that he was saying and saying you know what he said in relation to Brexit was wrong we need that to be brought more into the media that um, we analyse what people say and don't let people get away with saying things that are incorrect so I don't I don't think that that's necessarily a need for balance I, I think that there needs to be more of a, uh, the media needs to, I suppose, do more scrutiny uh, to um, fulfil its purpose. Um, I think Stephen McCaffrey's article had talked about um, what he thought the BBC's um, coverage effectively stopped at the border, but I suppose it come to their defence in this um, in this because I think that they do have coverage south of the border. We've even just seen this weekend they were covering incidents that happened in Donegal and they have a southern correspondent. So I don't think that their um, coverage stops at the border. Um, I think the problem perhaps, and I think this applies to the media across um, the board in the north in Northern Ireland, is that um, it is too Belfast centric and there seems to be, because people live in Belfast, suddenly something becomes an issue because it happens in Belfast. We've seen that, for example, with the Soldier F banners. As soon as a, a banner appeared on the, on the Lisburn Road, it was an issue. But previously, for weeks on end, after it was um, in towns across Northern Ireland, it wasn't talked about. But because you know some um, journalists who were driving down the Lisburn Road saw it, then it's suddenly an issue. So I think we need to um, widen our perspectives beyond um, what happens in Belfast and I think that we need more light than heat. On the balance point, I'm not saying that everyone who has an opinion is an informed opinion. What I'm saying is that we need balance. One side uh, informed. It's, it's the whole thing of we have too many experts. In fact, no, we're giving the same airtime to people who are coming up with completely left to centre. I was on uh, with Andrew Bridgen uh, during the week. He's the, 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 the Brexiteer MP. And, and he was telling me that everything's fine. And GAT24, GAT24 doesn't do that. So yeah, completely with the scrutiny. But what I'm saying is for people to make informed choices, they need balance on, on on both sides, but both of those people who are talking, telling different sides of the argument, need to be informed. What we don't need is just balloons of hot air. Okay, and we are out of time. We probably could have given a bit more to this uh, to this topic. It's got you all fired up. Um, but can I just thank my guests, Aidan Conley, Andrew Murphy, and Brendan Hughes. You can keep up to date with everything on sluggerotool.com. We'll be back next month for another Slugger TV. In the meantime, thank you for watching.